The Age of Voltaire, Chapter 7, The Germany of Bach, Part 2, German Life. Germany was now leading Europe in elementary education. In 1717, King Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia made primary education compulsory in his kingdom, and during the next 20 years he founded 1,700 schools to instruct and indoctrinate the young. These schools were usually taught by laymen. The role of religion in education was diminishing. Stress was laid on obedience and industry, and flogging was de rigueur. One schoolmaster reckoned that in 51 years of teaching, he had given 124,000 lashes with a whip, 136,715 slaps with one hand, 911,527 blows with a stick, and 1,115,800 boxes on the ear. In 1747, Julius Hecker, a Protestant clergyman, established in Berlin the first real school, so named because it added mathematics and industrial courses to Latin, German, and French. Soon most German cities had similar institutions. In the universities, the study of Greek rose to new prominence, laying the foundations for later German supremacy and Hellenic scholarship. Additional universities rose at Göttingen, 1737, and Erlangen, 1743. Financed by the Elector of Hanover, become King of England, Göttingen followed the University of Halle in according freedom of teaching to its professors and expanding instruction in natural sciences, social studies, and law. University students now discarded the academic gown, wore cloaks, sword, and spurs, fought duels, and took instruction from the looser ladies of the town. Except in philosophy and theology, German was the language of education. Nevertheless, the German language was now in bad repute, for the aristocracy was adopting French. Voltaire wrote from Berlin, November 24, 1750, I find myself here in France. No one talks anything but French. German is for the soldiers and the horses. It is needed only for the road. The German theater presented comedies in German, tragedies in French, usually from the French repertoire. Germany was the least nationalistic of European states because it was not yet a state. German literature suffered from this lack of national consciousness. The most influential German author of the age, Johann Christoph Gottsched, who gathered about him a literary circle that made Leipzig a little Paris, used German in his writings, but he imported his principles from Boileau, denounced Baroque art as glittering chaos, and called for a return to the classical rules of composition and style as practiced in France of Louis XIV. Two Swiss critics, Bomer and Breitinger, attacked Gottsched's admiration of order and rule. Poetry, they felt, took its power from forces of feeling and passion deeper than reason. Even a, in a racine world of emotion and violence, welled up through classic form, the best writings, Bodmer urged, are not the result of rules. The rules are derived from the writings. Christian Gellert, who exceeded all German writers in popularity, agreed with Bodmer, Breitinger, and Pascal that feeling is the heart of thought and the life of poetry. He deserved his Christian name. He was so respected for purity in his life and the gentleness of his ways that kings and princes attended his lectures on philosophy and ethics at the University of Leipzig, and women came to kiss his hands. He was a man of unashamed sentiment who mourned the dead at Rosbach instead of celebrating Friedrich's victory. Yet Friedrich, the greatest realist of the age, called him le plus raisonnable de tous les savants allemands, the most reasonable of all German savants. Friedrich, however, probably preferred Ewald Christian von Kleist, the viral young poet who died for him in the Battle of Kunzerdorf, 1759. The king's judgment of German literature was harsh but hopeful. We have no good writers, whatever. Perhaps they will rise when I'm walking up the Elysian fields. You will laugh at me for the pains I've taken to impart some notions of taste and attic salt to a nation which has hitherto known nothing but how to eat, drink, and fight. Meanwhile, Kant, Klopstock, Wieland, Lessing, Herder, Schiller, and Goethe had been born. One German of the time won Frederick's active sympathy. Christian von Wolff, son of a tanner, rose to be Professor at Halle. Taking on knowledge as a specialty, he tried to systematize it on the basis of Leibniz's philosophy. Through Monsieur du Chalet, called him un grand bavard, a great babbler, he pledged himself to reason. 
and in his stumbling way began the off room, the German Enlightenment. He broke precedent by teaching science and philosophy in German. Just to list his 67 books would clog our course. He began with a four-volume treatise on all the mathematical sciences, 1710, and he translated those volumes into Latin, 1713. He added a mathematical dictionary, 1716, to facilitate the transition to German. He proceeded with seven books, 1712 through 25, on logic, metaphysics, ethics, politics, physics, teleology, and biology, each title beginning bravely with the words, Vernon Fuch Gedank, Reasonable Thoughts as if to fly the flag of reason at his mask. Aspiring to a European audience, he covered the same vast area in eight Latin treatises, of which the most influential were the Psychologica Empirica, 1732, the Psychologica Rationalis, 1734, and the Theological Naturalis, 1736. After surviving all these pitfalls, he explored the philosophy of law, 1740 through 49, and to crown the edifice, he wrote an autobiography. The systematic march of his scholastic style makes him hard reading in our hectic age. But now and then he touched vital spots. He rejected Locke's derivation of all knowledge from sensation and served as a bridge from Leibniz to Kant by insisting on the active role of the mind in the formation of ideas. Body and mind, action and idea, are two parallel processes, neither influencing the other. The external world operates mechanically. It shows many evidences of purposive design but there are no miracles in it, and even the operations of the mind are subject to a determination of cause and effect. Ethics should seek a moral code independent of religious belief. It should not rely on God to terrify men into morality. The function of the state is not to dominate the individual, but to widen the opportunities for his development. The ethics of Confucius are especially to be praised, for they base morality not on supernatural revelation, but on human reason. The ancient emperors and kings of China were men of a philosophical turn, and to their care is owing that their form of government is all the best. Despite Wolf's earnest avowals of Christian belief, many Germans fought his philosophy dangerously heterodox. Some members of the Halley faculty warned Frederick William I that if Wolf's determinism were to be accepted, no soldier who deserted could be punished, and the whole structure of the state could collapse. The frightened king ordered the philosopher to leave Prussia in 48 hours on pain of immediate death. He fled to Marburg and its university, where the students hailed him as an apostle and a martyr of reason. Within 16 years, 1721 through 37, over 200 books or pamphlets were published attacking or defending him. One of the first official acts of Frederick the Great after his accession in 1740 was his warm invitation to the exile to return to Prussia and Halle. Wolf came, and in 1734 he was made chancellor of the university. He grew more orthodox as he aged and died 1754 with all the piety of an orthodox Christian. His influence was far greater than one would judge from his present paltry fame. France made him an honorary member of her Academy des Sciences, the Imperial Academy of St. Petersburg named him Professor Emeritus, and the English and Italians translated him assiduously. The King of Naples made the Wolfian system obligatory in his universities. The younger generation of Germans called him the sage and felt that he had taught Germany to think. The old scholastic methods of teaching declined, academic freedom increased. Martin Nutzman took the Wolfian philosophy to the University of Konigsberg where he taught Immanuel Kant. The development of science and philosophy and the disillusioning consequences of biblical research shared with powerful secularizing forces in weakening the influence of religion on German life. Theistic ideas coming in from England through translations and through the connection of England with Hanover, spread among the upper class, but their effect was negligible compared with the result of the subordination of the church, Catholic as well as Protestant, to the state. The Reformation had for a time strengthened religious belief. The Thirty Years' War had injured it. Now the subservience of the clergy to the ruling princes deprived them of the godly ore that had sanctioned their power. Appointments to ecclesiastical office were dictated by the prince or local feudal lord. The nobility, as in England, affected religion as a matter of political utility and social form. The Lutheran and Calvinist clergy lost status, and Catholicism slowly gained ground. In this period, the Protestant states of Saxony, Württemberg, and Hesse passed under Catholic rulers, and the agnostic Friedrich had to conciliate Catholic Silesia. Only one religious movement prospered in Protestant areas, 
that of the Unitas Fratrum, the Moravian Brethren. In 1722, some of its members, oppressed in Moravia, migrated to Saxony and found refuge on the estate of Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Himself a godson of Philip Jacob Spanier, the young count saw in the refugees a chance to revive the spirit of pietism. He built for them on his lands the village of Harenut, the Lord's Hill, and spent nearly all his fortune in printing Bibles, catechisms, hymn books, and other literature for their use. His travels to America, 1741 through 42, England, 1750, and elsewhere helped to establish colonies of the Unitas Fratrum in every continent. Indeed, it was the Moravian Brethren who inaugurated the modern missionary activity in the Protestant churches. Peter Boyler's meeting with John Wesley in 1735 brought a strong influence of the Brethren into the Methodist movement. In America, they settled near Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and in Salem, North Carolina. They kept their faith and discipline almost untouched by winds of doctrine and fashions of dress, perhaps at the cost of some hardness of spirit in their family relations, but the skeptic must respect the strength and sincerity of their belief and its exceptional accord with their moral life. Morals in this age were generally more wholesome in Germany than in France, except where imitation of France passed from language to lechery. In the middle classes, family life was subject to an almost fanatical discipline. Fathers habitually whipped their daughters and sometimes their wives. Frederick William I kept the court of Berlin in fearsome order, but his daughter described the Saxon court at Dresden as quite up to that of Louis XV in adultery. Augustus the Strong, we are sure on dubious authority, had 354 natural children, some of whom forget their common parentage in incestuous beds. Augustus himself was alleged to have taken, as one of his mistresses, his bastard daughter Countess Orgzelska, who later taught the Ars Amois to Frederick the Great. In the early 18th century, the Faculty of the Law of the University of Halle issued a pronouncement defending princely concubinage. Manners were strict but laid no claim to Gaelic grace or conversational charm. The nobles, shorn of political power, warmed themselves with uniforms and titles. I've known, wrote Lord Chesterfield in 1748, many a letter returned unopened because one title in twenty had been omitted in the direction. Oliver Goldsmith's judgment was patriotically harsh. Let the Germans have their due. If they are dull, no nation alive assumes a more laudable solemnity, a, or better understands the decorum of stupidity. And Frederick the Great agreed with him. Eating continued to be a popular way of spending the day. Furniture took over the styles of carving and marquetry then flourishing in France. But there was nothing in France or England quite as jolly as the gaily colored ceramic stoves that roused the envy of Lady Mary Montague. German gardens were Italianate, but German houses with their half-timbered fronts, mullion windows, and protected eaves gave to German towns a colorful charm revealing a keen, however unformulated, aesthetic sense. And indeed it was a German, Alexander Baumgarten, who in his aesthetic of 1750 established the modern use of that term and announced a theory of beauty and art as a part and a problem of philosophy.